we could have your attention. Dr. Amanda Morris is an associate professor of writing and rhetoric at Kutztown University of Pennsylvania. Her scholarship and much of her public writing and speaking engagements focus on contemporary indigenous rhetorics. Her academic writing can be found in Rhetoric Review, Epiphany, WSQ, Journal of American Culture. Can you pronounce that word? Enthemima. Enthemima. South Atlantic Review and the book Stand-Up Comedy and Rhetoric and Decolonizing Native American Rhetoric, Communicating Self-Determination. Yeah. Amanda is a contributing writer to Teaching Tolerance, an online project of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And if you go on her website, you can click and get links to her articles. So please help me welcome Amanda Morris. Thank you all. I appreciate being back here today. I was here last year, late last year, with my colleague, Dr. Colleen Clemens, talking about toxic masculinity. So I am so thankful for you two inviting me back to talk about my specialty, <laughs> which is contemporary indigenous rhetorics. So before we begin, I would like us to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on today has long served as a site of meeting and exchange for the indigenous peoples of the Lenape Nation, also called the Delaware Indians by settlers. As we work together today, we honor and respect the indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which we gather. <laughs> Starting again, not gonna do the land acknowledgement, just edit that out. Okay, this is a story. It's a story of resilience, resistance, and reclamation. This is a myth-busting story. So on your note cards, what I want you to do is I just, don't overthink it, don't take too long. Just whatever the first three words that come to mind when you hear the phrase Native American, right. This should take you three seconds. <laughs> and Jason is kind enough to collect the cards for me because we are going to be returning to these toward the end. We're gonna talk, but don't worry, put, don't put your name on it. It's totally anonymous and there is no wrong answer, right? So this is not about judgment, it's not about guilt. I just want you to write down the three words that come to mind, whatever that may be, okay? When you have done this, pass them over this way. Pass them that way, <laughs> thank you. I'll give you a second. <laughs> oh, I see we have an overachiever in our midst. Were you the A student who sat in the front, who always knew the answer? <laughs> well, good for you. You've got double the amount. It's great. <laughs> All right, so all those are passed forward. <laughs> okay, so let's start with question one. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh my God, oh my God. It's like the day of dropping things. It's fine, thank you. <laughs> all right, we got this now. We're cooking with oil. So question one, and again, these these. I'm, must, I'm busting myths about Native Americans. These are questions that Native peoples get all the time. Scholars of indigenous rhetorics get all the time. I mean, these are very, very basic questions. So I'm just gonna preface this by saying, if you already have some advanced knowledge, I apologize if I'm repeating things, but just bear with me because this is the talk that we agreed to do. Okay, <clears throat> so question one. Are Native Americans still here? Okay, well, I got, good, you're with me on that. Okay, so yes, the short answer is yes. Native peoples are still very much with us. I think there's a big assumption in our culture and even in our education system, I'm looking at Diane, we can agree on this, right? <laughs> that Native peoples are often presented as peoples of the past. We have relegated them very often to this static position um, of cultures that are no longer here. So, in other words, they are peoples who are no longer alive, right? And you see that in the teaching of them, the talking about them. But they are very much alive and thriving and surviving the genocide that was committed by our government so many years ago. Colonization is something that still remains. These people remain colonized, 
okay? And you can see that in the lyrics of contemporary indigenous rappers. So, <clears throat> America is not in a post-colonial state. The indigenous peoples of this land remain colonized, and we, settlers, are part of the problem, and we continue to benefit from that early and ongoing colonization. So every argument, every position, it is all framed in our culture by colonization. And it's about disparaging and delegitimizing diminishing and erasing indigenous presence and people. It really is an uphill battle to try and reverse, um, to reverse that, but it's a battle that many of us are fighting. That was Matika Wilbur. She is a photographer, native photographer. Her work is called Project 562. I strongly recommend you check out her work. And you can watch the rest of this TED Talk on your own. So <clears throat> there are layers of experience and reality that I think a lot of us just don't know, because that's not our reality. And this book here, All the Real Indians Died Off, tries to do some of that work to help people understand. It was written by Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz and Dina Giglio Whitaker. It came out in 2016 and it was reviewed by Paul Willetto for the Tribal College Journal of American Indian Higher Education. So let's just take a moment and think about the fact that there is a scholarly journal focused on tribal colleges and American Indian higher education. Something that probably at least most of you have not heard of. So that, but it exists, and this is good, progress. Willetta writes, quote, the book critically deconstructs persistent and annoying myths and stereotypes about American Indians. The authors analyze what are imagined mythologies and then reconstruct what the facts are. To use, the, to use the author's own words, the book is, quote, a call to action to envision a better future for everyone, Indian and non-Indian alike. It's well-researched, and here are some of the myths addressed in this book. So myth number three is Columbus discovered America. No. Actually, I got a sidebar. One of my favorite t-shirts that I... Um, designed by uh, Navajo designer Jared Yazzie. His company is Oxdox, O-X-D-X. And it's a black t-shirt with yellow writing. It says, Native Americans discovered Columbus. <laughs> I try to wear it heavily every fall. <laughs> Especially in October. <laughs> but like, you can buy that t-shirt. It's on their website. Um, OK, so, <laughs> so Columbus discovered America, no. Uh, Willetto writes, quote, when in reality, Columbus, was a lost and self-described perpetrator of genocidal acts who was elevated to a first-class folk hero with a national holiday in his name. Myth 16 imagines Indian casinos as an economic and political threat analogous to the 19th century Indian threat. Myth 19 is that Indian women are princesses or, quote, squaws revealing a sexist, racist, and imagined view of Native women. Indigenous peoples have been rendered invisible by our government, our education systems, and our culture so efficiently and effectively that most people never think about Native peoples at all, much less as living contemporary people making art, writing, activism, scholarship, laws, music, films, comedy, journalism, fashion, and on and on and on. We must all do better to see indigenous peoples. So on to question two, another basic one. 
Are all natives the same? I'm glad to see some of you shaking your heads no. That is correct. The answer is no. At present, there are 573 federally recognized tribes in the United States today. Not counting Canada, not counting Central America, South America, Europe, <laughs> anywhere else in the world, and also not counting those native peoples who are not in federally recognized tribes, but who are very much culturally and communally connected members of their nations. It's a complicated question. So not only are there unique tribal cultures, but they all have their own cultural practices, ceremonies, belief systems, creation mythologies, languages, day-to-day -day life, government, gender roles, life ways, food ways. Every Native American nation has its own identity. So we as settlers tend to conflate all Native peoples into one homogenous group and they are very much not. So I did want to bring the idea of language to you about how indigenous language did once flourish along with, um, along with the indigenous peoples in this land. But indigenous languages still continue to account for a large portion of the nation's linguistic diversity. Um, I found this article on Babbel magazine. So Babbel is the language learning app. Maybe some of you use it. Uh, it's called What Was and What Is Native American Languages in the U.S. And it talks about how we got to where we are now with indigenous languages, the native languages, and what's been happening to them. And a couple important points from this article I just wanted to pull the Columbia Encyclopedia cites a widely accepted estimate that there were more than 15 million speakers of over 2,000 indigenous languages spoken across the entire Western Hemisphere at the time of Columbus's arrival. Now that's diversity, right? And also another quote I'm pulling, according to the Indigenous Language Institute, there were once more than 300 indigenous languages spoken in the United States, and approximately 175 remain today. They also estimate that without restoration efforts, there will be um, at most 20 still spoken in 2050, and that's not actually that far away. So if you want to know more, I suggest reading this article. It's a good one to get you started. <clears throat> now, one of my own personal experiences that I had, I was just talking to this gentleman about this before the talk started, uh, I had the honor of going to the Osage Nation out in Oklahoma, their territory, and doing some research uh, with, with and about uh, their nation, specifically related to culture and language and actually their website design. <laughs> um, this is back when I was working on my dissertation. When I went and visited with the cultural center director there, it was back, you know, I was working on my dissertation, she directed me to the language program director. So this is one of the nations, the Osage nation, that has a language reclamation program. <clears throat> they had their fluent speakers, so their native speakers of their original Osage language, which several years ago their last original fluent speaker died. So they are now at second generation language learners, right? So they're all their original speakers are gone. But back when I visited them, there were still some still around. So they had those speakers of the Osage language write down, create a syllabary, an alphabet, and create the, the Osage language in written form so that they can teach newer, younger, and different members of the community, wherever they are, in Oklahoma or around the world. And if you go to their language department section here, I don't know if you can see that, but they have an app, <laughs> they have online classes. So if you are a member of the Osage Nation, or even if you're not a member of the Osage Nation, you wanna learn the Osage language, there are all these ways to do it now. So they feel that their language and their culture are synonymous, and I, I don't wanna to generalize too much, but at least the native folks that I know, and that I've talked to, and that I've listened to, it does seem to me that they, a lot of them really do consider their culture and their language to be synonymous. So in other words, if you lose your language, 
you also lose your culture, right? So one of the citations in this Babel article, go back to the Babel article, this one, uh, Greg Anderson, who's the director of Living Tongues, told National Geographic that only five language families exist in Oregon today, compared to 14 language families in Oregon 200 years ago. So with the loss of languages, all kinds of wonderful things that speakers did with their languages vanished. Great works of oral literature, multilingual performances, dances that accompany those stories, local knowledge about flora and fauna, ecosystem management, local place names, spiritual values, on and on. They're all submerged, altered, or gone because the original languages that express those concepts are now gone or no longer well understood. So, very long, complicated answer, no. Native peoples are not the same, and they do also do not speak the same language. Finally is question three. Who gets to be considered Native American, or who counts? So this comes up a lot. Native peoples get asked this all the time. And now, if you're paying attention to the news, we're dealing with this issue right now in national politics because of the Elizabeth Warren DNA debacle and her claims about Cherokee heritage. So I will preface this section by saying I am not a legal scholar in indigenous issues. I am a rhetorics scholar. And I will try to walk you through the basics, but if you want to know more about this particular issue, I'm gonna share a link with you at the end of this portion that will allow you to individually dig deeper. It was put together by three indigenous scholars. So just hang tight for that. Okay, so <laughs> bottom line, DNA claims are generally bullshit. I hope I can swear. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> and they don't prove anything. So when you read what indigenous writers, scholars, and activists are saying, it's clear that membership in any indigenous nation involves so much more than DNA. First of all, the nation must claim you back. That's sort of a big ticket high up, very important. Here's the thing. Anybody can say, oh yeah, I'm part Cherokee. But making a claim like that, think about it. If that community doesn't claim you back and you don't participate in the cultural life of that community, your claim is pretty weak. So this is an article I found on Splinter News by a native writer named Anna Pulley. She cites a Pew Research Center study that showed that fully half of all US adults who claim a multi-racial identity said they were white and American Indian. That's eight and a half million people. Eight and a half, eight and a half million people. She also talked to Tate Walker, who was the editor of Native Peoples Magazine, who says this about the Pew Research Center study, quote, this is Tate Walker, her quote, I would love those 8.5 8 million people to be Native American, but there's another step to that, that you participate fully in the community you're claiming. So let's talk briefly about registration because this is actually why the problem is so complex. Federal recognition of a tribe is what, gi what quote, gives members benefits. I'm kind of just very gently putting everything in air quotes because gives is a loaded word. It's not really gives, they, but it's, it's, that's, what the, that's where the benefits come from. So federal, federal recognition. When you're an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe, you receive a literal card. It's called a CDIB, or Certificate of Degree of Indian or Alaska Native Blood card. Can you imagine? So it's actually a tribal enrollment card. And it's also related to the idea of being, quote, on the rolls. So if you ever hear Native people talking about being on the rolls or not being on the rolls, that's what that means. If your family, 200 years ago, agreed to be on the rolls, then you are considered to be legitimately a member of that nation by the federal government. 
Okay, so that's the barometer for the federal government. In the Splinter article, Anna Pulley says that these cards and rolls were introduced to indigenous people by the federal government to break up Indian land so that settlers could use it and force tribal communities to assimilate into American culture. You could understand why maybe some of the folks back in the day would be skeptical about enrolling, causing problems today now for their descendants who, yes, they are fully members, but they can't, quote, prove it because they they're not on the rolls. So there is no one overarching right answer. Some Native peoples opted in, some didn't. It's kind of like what we were talking about, there's a lot of gray area and you embrace the mess. This is a messy question, very messy. So for those of us on the outside looking in to this issue in indigenous nations, it's just this complicated mess. There's a lot of people who have written about it, indigenous scholars and legal experts and attorneys, and I encourage if you want to know more, go look them up, okay? So, so Pulley says, so the only simple yes, no here is that yes, native peoples are still here, but everything else is a little more complicated. Pulley says it's difficult to imagine, say, an Italian American being asked to prove his or her identity through blood quantum or any, any, any of the other relentless ways that indigenous people have been asked to prove who they are for the last hundreds of years. Tate Walker says, it's the most colonial mindset I can grasp. This idea that native identity can be put on a certificate, almost like a dog breed. And then there's this. A lot of, I will do question and answer at the end. And then there's this. A lot of people have been told they are part native through family stories. So think about a person applying to college. I'm a college professor. Let's go there. And you have to check a box about who you are. Who gets to check the box that they're Native American? Must your family have a tribal enrollment card? No. See, that's the problem. The answer is no. If eight and a half million Americans are checking the box that they're part Native American Indian and there's clearly not eight and a half million members of federally recognized tribes, there's a problem with the system of determining who, quote, gets to be Native American. And this is also about family history, is it not? Because there are real consequences to claiming this identity as a Native American or part Native American, but not participating in that culture of the nation that you are claiming. I like what Tate Walker said about how the community is claiming you back to. I think that's a really important component. My understanding, based on my reading and research, is that only tribal governments have the right to enroll a member. So you can claim anything you want, but unless that tribe does the research and finds out through whatever means they've determined to decide who gets to be a member of their nation, unless they do that and, and give you the check mark, like, yes, we accept you, then anybody can make the claim. It's complicated. So what do we do then with somebody who says, maybe claims native identity? Do we believe them just because they're saying it? Because lots of people may have claimed indigenous identity to try and gain legitimacy in some way, to use that as a way to claim power. So the question then becomes, do I just say, okay, because this person is saying that and I just need to accept it? And I'll be honest with you, that's exactly what I do. I've read these heartbreaking stories of Native peoples who are absolutely participating in their cultures, in their communities. They are members of their nation from a participatory standpoint, and they're claimed back. But every story they've told, every cultural practice they have, in addition to being modern people in this world, they're absolutely part of that indigenous identity and culture. And simply because our federal government doesn't recognize that group as a nation, they aren't considered legit. And maybe their nation's fighting for federal recognition to prove that they should be accepted as a nation, even though they have hundreds, thousands of years of, of, in their minds, plenty of evidence and proof 
but the federal government has this roles requirement. Did you enroll back in the day? Well, then now you have a steeper climb to prove you're even here and you're part of that group. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> and I actually have a lot of sympathy for people who say that they have an indigenous identity based on family stories and knowledge and their own understanding and what they've been told. Because right? think about it, as a kid or as a young adult, you're, you know what you're told by your family. So why would, you, why would you question that? And then you have people who are outside you, outside who don't know you and your family say, no, you're not. And the federal government says, no, you're not. Prove it. Were you on the rolls? Oh, no? Well, then. Right? It's, 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 it's heartbreaking. So it's not my job to tell them they're wrong. <laughs> and at the same time, we were talking about seeing both sides. I also have a lot of sympathy for these federally recognized tribes that are trying to figure out who their members are, really. <laughs> it's, it's complicated. It's messy. Just remember, this is, important, this is the important thing. The federal government created this problem hundreds of years ago. And now these nations and individual people are having to clean up the mess. So I actually have a lot of sympathy for all sides of the issue. But for me, when I have a student in my class, who I teach, I'm teaching an indigenous rhetorics class this spring, and inevitably halfway through the semester, a student will come up and self-identify as part native, or, oh, you know, my grandmother always said, or, oh, you know, my... my my, my mom always told me, you know, my aunt or her Cherokee heritage or she came around the farm or Lenape or Chickasaw or whatever the nation. I never tell that student, well, can you prove it? That's not my job. So again, this structural problem exists because of our federal government. And it continues to be incredibly unfair to all of the people who actually are indigenous on this land. And there is no clean answer. But if you want to dig deeper, and I recommend you do, because like I said, national landscape, there's a big connection right now. I recommend checking out this new syllabus created by three indigenous scholars. It's the uh, Elizabeth Warren Cherokee Citizenship and DNA Testing Syllabus. And um, they have links to readings, things you can watch, uh, both scholarship and um, sort of more consumer-based kind of writing to help you understand this issue a little bit more and to give you some fodder for when somebody talks about how great Elizabeth Warren is and you know maybe why you should look at it with a little more complicated lens instead of just accepting one way or the other. Um, finally, before we get to what you wrote down, I wanted to give you some indigenous folks to follow on social media and some sources to look up. So. I encourage you to take photos of these slides. And of course, I know, Jason, this is going to be on the video later. So uh, these are some folks to follow on Twitter and on Instagram. I follow all these people. If you want to know what contemporary Native peoples, artists, writers, scholars, photographers, filmmakers, etc., are doing and thinking and what they care about, start following these folks and then look at their feeds to see who they're following and build your feed from there. And you will gain so much knowledge and information, and it really opened your eyes to show you what our indigenous brothers and sisters are talking about, what they care about, versus what we see in our sort of mainstream media. We will send that out in the newsletter and put Thank it on you. the website too. Thank you, Jason. Okay, so then uh, also some additional sources. I, um, the, and there's links here, so if you're including it in the newsletter, make sure you include the links. Um, a short fiction piece, a couple comics collections, um, which I actually teach with both of these. They're fantastic. Moonshot and Dear Woman. And some music. Um, uh, you could listen to this on your phone. You go to nativeradio.com. I suggest the Stream 6, the contemporary stream. There is a traditional powwow stream, so if you want traditional powwow drumming, um, you, there's another stream for that, but I like the contemporary stream. It's where you find uh, musicians like Drazus, the uh, Cree rapper that I shared with you earlier. Uh, indigenous media outlets to follow, so instead of New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post, uh, also add these to your feed. Indian Country Today, uh, Native Max, and Native Appropriations. And then these are a bunch of teaching tolerance articles that I've written about contemporary indigenous issues. So you can check it out, especially if you're a teacher. There's links and resources. So let's talk about your three words. Let me get your cards here. <clears throat> And there's no judgment here. And I'm just doing this randomly. OK. So let's see. 
new senator, yes, and new representative in the House of uh, Representatives. Spirituality, sovereignty, identity. Let's see what else we have here. Lenape. Uh, let's see, what are these here? Cheated, cultural, honor, land, people's original, spiritual, abused, marginalized. Acorns, feathers, group. Let's see. Um, nature, chief, theft, peaceful, equitable. Let's see, tribe. Can't read that. That's me not being able to see handwriting. I apologize. Feathers, outdoors, face paint. So that's just a, a general sampling. And I got to tell you, you're right in line with what my students write. Because very often, you know, w where we get our information, and like I said, the, the contemporary mainstream media, our educational outlets, all the messaging we're getting, it doesn't present Native peoples as living, real, contemporary, right along with us. I mean, if you look around this room, we could literally be sitting in a room full of indigenous peoples because they look like us, we look like them. They, they dress like us, we look... So, you know, they're not wearing ceremonial regalia all the time. They wear, you know, sh cool shirts and t-shirts and sweatshirts and jeans and t sneakers. And so uh, busting all these assumptions wide open is, is really important. So now you know a different story. And I want you to think about what you can do to disrupt Native American stereotypes in your own world. And I always tell students, you know, think in terms of little bites because it seems like a really big problem, right? When you realize the structural nature of the problem and the representation of, of Native peoples today. But what can you do individually? So I told you about the t-shirt that I have that I wear that usually provokes a conversation or a comment. This shirt was designed by Tammy Beauvais of the Mohawk Nation. This bracelet was designed by Kristen jo Dorsey, a jewelry designer of the Chickasaw Nation. Little moves. If you're going to buy yourself a new piece of jewelry, buy native made instead of native inspired. Right? You don't have to spend a ton of money. Everything I've purchased is under 100 or under 50 bucks. Um, you can also read, look at the resources. You can follow these people on your social media. If you're on social media of any kind, there are native folks out there to follow. Even if you just follow one or two, you'll, do, you'll know more than your neighbor does. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be improving your, your, your knowledge. And then when one of your friends in your social media feed says, oh, I've never heard of that, conversation, bam. It's a good first step. So don't think in big, broad strokes. Think in teeny, teeny, tiny little movements, little small things that you can do. And, and it's achievable. Anybody have any ideas about any that you're thinking, like what you might want to do yourself? that you'd like to share with the group? Yes? I, I don't think this only happens to Native Americans. I grew up being told family stories that um, Native American, which I believe Dad had stories of growing up with other like, people that were Native American, the stories of friends, the one that lived in their house for a while, was great friends with Teddy Roosevelt, and he had real letters of communication. So I believe it. But you didn't say that. If you, if you said that when you're a child, what, did you, what are you? You know, you're, you're Italian, you're German. Well, I have some name that. I'm not well. Um, Welsh. Welsh is acceptable. <laughs> People know where Wales is. The other one is Tyrolean, which I didn't really understand, but I believe that it existed. I've seen the church with a plaque with a grandfather's name on. They established the first. Tyrolean church in, in the community, and where I grew up. Um, but I went to a, a geography teacher and said, I don't understand this. My, my family says I'm Tyrolean. Tell me more. This is a geography teacher. What's, what's Tyrol? That's where my family. Tyrol? There's no, there's no Tyrol. What are you talking So I'm, I'm down to, oh, Cam Welsh. Because <laughs> the only one people understand. And I did learn Tyrol was a country. It was somehow absorbed during the war and to other, and um, my best friend at the time, who was in the geography class with me, visited Tyrol and sent me a doll back to say, I found it. <laughs> it's here, it exists, let's go back to that. 
So what you're saying is, you know, part of what you can do is ask questions, especially if you've received some of that information yourself, if you're one of the people who've heard through family stories or something you've been told, you can take a step by investigating, right? And if you really are part Native American, you're part Cherokee, you're part Lenape, you're part Chickasaw, Seminole, Inuit, whatever the nation is, take the extra step and, and actually try to become a participating member in that community, even if there's no role to join, even if nothing. You can educate yourself, the rest of your family, about that nation and become more invested and participate in it, right? So that's something that you can do. Anybody else have any other ideas about how you can work to disrupt some of these stereotypes? Let's use the mic, though, because otherwise it's not going to get picked <laughs> yeah, up in the video. Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, I, I talked to you a little bit before the, mm -hmm. the class, um, and I'm very concerned about preserving as much of the kinds of symbolic expression that the Native Americans had years ago and everything. And I've had trouble connecting with, uh, with, with elders, and I had mentioned that to you. And they may consider that disrespectful. They may consider that disre I'm disrespectful of their nature, of their, of their culture and everything. And, but I'm a historian, and I want to preserve, and that's what I've been doing for 45 years. And, and in one sense, I really don't know whether I'm doing things right or wrong. But from my perspective, things should be preserved. Whether you're, you know, for future gener present generations and future generations. So that people, Native Americans or non-Native Americans or anything in between, can appreciate what, what they did. And they can better understand human nature. So what happens? I agree. Uh, what happens with... Well, well what happens with, with trying to... I heard stories where I, I was telling you uh, that this uh, grand, grandfather of, a, of this Native American that I was talking to didn't want to, to have her daughter be told about certain cultural uh, traditions, which well, was shocking to well, me uh, well, from it, my perspective. Is it really, though? Because, I mean, well, why remember, would... remember, Native peoples have been told by settlers who they are, who they're allowed to be, you know, who, what space they're allowed to take up, mm -hmm. um, what uh, traditions and cultures and clothing and hair is acceptable to us Americans, us settlers. So, I mean, is it really any surprise that maybe an elder would be very cautious and skeptical about saying, hey, no, 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 let me tell her. I'm not That's denigrating not them at all. Job. I can understand yeah. their position. My point, my, my suggestion to you and to anybody else would be, if you would like to engage with a nation and their culture and maybe their preservation practices because you have something to offer to help, contact the nation directly, find out who their cultural center director is, find out who, right? So every, every almost, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say, at most of the nations, especially in the federally recognized ones, they have um, some, some money and some space. They have a cultural center. And all you have to do is call the tribal nation. Most nations also have a website, an official website at this point, so it's kind of easy to find. Like I showed you the Osage Nation site. They have a cultural center. You call them up. The Lenape Nation in New Jersey has a center, has people doing this work. If you'd want to work locally with them, you would ask them, what can I, I have this skill set. What can I do to help you preserve X, Y, Z? I would like to offer my help. You, so in other words, you sh so you shift that from I'm going to come in and tell you how to preserve to how can I help you do this thing? Because a lot of them probably do want to, what you say, preserve, whatever it's documents or artifacts or whatnot, stories, but maybe they don't have a ton of people on site and in the nation who can do that work. But if someone from the outside, native or not, comes in and says, hey, I want to help. How can I help? Here's my expertise. I'd like to help you. You tell me how I can help you. Yeah, that's a very let good approach, them, I think. Yeah, let them that tell really you, yeah. right? Because, and it actually, it really does make a difference. But, in, I mean, if you think about it in your own lives, too, wouldn't you rather be asked instead of told, right? I mean, aren't we all kind of like that? I mean, and, and, and especially for Native folks, it's even more loaded because of, like, all the things I just said. So take that extra that's step. Really good. I really appreciate yeah. it. Sure. What else? Um, and also, any questions? Yeah, um, questions, anything? All right. Even ideas of breaking up stereotypes or questions? Yes. Well, I have a comment because um, I have experienced traveling through Arizona and whatever. And also, uh, there's a tribe on Long Island, Shinnecox, and they throw on these festivals and they're big tourist attractions. 
But this is the impression that the majority of people come away with of what they, their culture is. It's a big show. They're not really getting into what being. And if you drive through Arizona, you do drive through the areas where there's the homes and trailers out in the countryside that people don't understand. This is what the real life is, not just this powwow that they're putting on for tourists. Well, to that I would say, um, you know, Native folks want to make money too. <laughs> I mean, and they are modern peoples trying to navigate our modern world just like the rest of us. And, you know, if they choose to share some of their ceremonial regalia, dances, um, you know, publicly accessible practices, because believe me, these nations who are participating, they're not sharing their sacred dances. They're not sacred. They're the public dances. So like the social dances and things like that that are open to the public. They often ask folks, hey, come on up. Is anybody coming into the circle and dance? That means because it's a community. And you heard what Matika Wilbur said about all of us five fingers. We're all related. So of course they want to share their culture, at least part of it, with as many people as possible because they've been rendered invisible. So this makes them visible. Is it ideal? Hmm, maybe not. Maybe is it one-sided? Sure. But they're visible, right? So if you take someone who goes to one of these powwows and they see the beautiful, they see the beautiful regalia and they see the beautiful um, dances and the, and the fantastic music and they, they eat some food and they're like, oh, this is great. Maybe some of those people are now curious. I wonder what this nation is like today. And maybe they'll go look it up. Or maybe they won't. Maybe that is the sum total of their exposure. But I think for a lot of people who go to those events, I think I, I'm, I'm, I guess maybe I'm being an optimist here. I, I tend to believe that a lot of people, if they're there for the first time, they're sort of like, oh my God, I didn't know they still existed. Okay, so number one. Oh my God, there's all these different regalia, different dances, different music. I didn't know they were different, too. Right? And now three, huh. So I wonder what else I don't know. And that starts it, right? So to me, as an optimist, I'm hoping that. But I, you're right. I think for a lot of people, that is the sum total. And I mean, you can't solve everything. <laughs> you got you to gotta work with what you have. I tell my students all the time, right, they come into class about three weeks in, and they're like so frustrated and angry because they're like, this is a huge problem. This is injustice. This is terrible. We need to fix this. And I say, OK, well, are you going to stay angry for the rest of your life? <laughs> right? Like, that's not healthy. So yeah, yeah, it is a problem. But Focus on the positive, right? Talk to the people who are willing to listen. So, you know, your uncle who's a diehard, like, anti-anything that's not American, right? Don't bother. It's not worth your time. Don't, you're banging a head against the wall. But your friend, your roommate, someone, maybe some part of your family, a cousin, who's like, what is that you're reading there? When you pick up a book and you're reading there, there, you're reading Dear Woman, or you're reading something, what is that? Open door to a conversation, right? Little moves, little moves. If we all do those little things, imagine the impact. It really can create a tidal wave. But we all have to kind of participate in that, in that healing participatory process. Yes. All right, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Mike is coming. You know, with all this, I'm, I'm thinking road trip. You know, to go and visit some of these places. Now, I, I know in, in D.C., assuming the, uh, the uh, quote thing is over, you can get to the visit the one there. Oh, right. I actually don't know. The uh, National Museum of the American Indian, run by the Smithsonian, it is one of the most beautiful museums in the country, much less in D.C. It's the most beautiful museum in D.C., and it's the one museum I recommend without hesitation, all the time, every day, all day long. It's not perfect, but it's damn close. Okay, so they what about, do it right. What about a road trip to uh, visit different places? Oh, there's one in uh, New York too, in NMAI. So there's DC and New York. Yeah, do it. Road trip. I'm like all Arizona for it. Arizona? Yeah, you could go. There's a, the Herd Museums out there, the Watcom Museums up in Seattle. I mean, yeah, sure, road trip. Go for it. I, I was just, I just, uh, my husband and I drove across the country to Santa Fe in August. Yeah, that's. 
Um, <laughs> but, but it was amazing, you know, it really is amazing to sort of see the depth and breadth and scale of this nation as you drive across, quote, flyover country, but then also get a chance to see some of these smaller museums and communities, indigenous and non, um, that, that you maybe never heard of or see something, right? So it, it's, yeah, it's worth it. I took, go for it. On the mile-long <laughs> stretch of road that we clean up, there's the Museum of Indian Culture right yeah, here in exactly. Allentown. And they have a great, and they actually talk about the uh, powwows. They have a great festival. I think it's in, at the end of August called the uh, Roasting festival. Ears of Corn. Roasting yeah, Ears we, of Corn. We volunteered uh, to yeah. help a couple years ago. Maybe we'll do it's that awesome. again. It's uh, fantastic. And you see so many different kinds of people. And they're not a lot of, you, it's not all Native folks. There's Native folks go and non-Native folks go. And it's a celebration. And it's, you know, the celebration of the five fingers, right? We're all together. We're all seeing the positive and having a good time, eating some good corn and Indian tacos and so yes. many hands up. You had your yeah. I was gonna say she had her hand up first, but <laughs> that's okay. I just wanted to add, we have a museum in Easton for the Lenape, for the Lenape. Yeah. So that yeah, there's a Lenape museum in in Easton, and then there's and I don't I haven't been there. I gotta say to the there's a Lenape cultural center in New Jersey, and I I, I actually follow it on on the different social media, but I haven't been there yet, but I know they're there. So in other words, the Lenape used to be here, right? As I said in our land, our land acknowledgement. Um, so they're probably still here. There are Lenape folks in this area still, but they don't have, um, they don't have a physical space here in Pennsylvania like they do still in New Jersey. Uh, and, you know, if that has changed, and it might, I mean, things change all the time. If that has changed, somebody correct me. But as from my understanding, there is no sort of central place you can go to see, you know, Pennsylvania Lenape culture. I mean, you can go to the museum, but it's n like it's not a cultural center for Lenape people kind of a thing. Yes, please. Okay, just to start, I'd like to say that the um, D.C., uh, the Smithsonian, has the best cafeteria it in does. all in, out of any museum I've ever been to in Washington. Really they have, because they have food from... Um, um, native cultures from South America, Mexico, all four corners, all all over yeah. the place. That's wonderful. Agreed. Okay, but years ago, I volunteered through Elder Hostel and went out to the Navajo Reservation for a week. I've never seen such poverty in my life. Have you ever been to Pine Ridge? No, South I haven't. Dakota? Okay. But that that's the other thing. I mean, all the things what we've talked about today were kind of like upbeat kind of things. What we can right. do, but there's a real there's real issues that um, I don't know. How do you address things like that? Like the I'm real glad you level brought that up. Poverty. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, in all honesty, if I wanted to stand up here and depress you for an hour, I could do that. I, I could have done that, and I choose not to, because when you do hear about Native peoples today, it is those statistics. What? But not all Native peoples live on reservations. There are many Native folks living in cities and urban communities and rural areas, and they're doing just fine. I, you know, and I prefer to focus on the positive, the things that they're doing to make meaning, the artwork, the photography, the writing, the scholarship, the legal practice, the all of those things. They are full human beings, fully participating in their own cultures, their own communities, and our broader culture, we never hear about that. So you're right, but I would be doing those folks that I know, that I'm trying to be accountable to, those indigenous folks that I know, I would be doing them a grave disservice if all I did when I spoke to groups is talk about how awful things are on reservations. Because that is not the sum total or broad scope picture of indigenous experience in this, in this land at all. It doesn't even come close. It's like this much. And so, yeah, there is truth to that. There is truth to poverty, alcoholism, diabetes, family breakups, missing and murdered indigenous women, boarding school, genocide. I could talk to you about all of that. Well, that's what I'm saying, is, is you're right. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying when you hear about Native folks, that's what you hear. That's what you hear. But that's what I saw. Right, that's what you saw. And what I'm telling you I understand what you're saying. is a different story. To see, to broaden out the scope of what you know and make it a little bit wider and more, and just realize 
There are some amazing things being written, created, made today by Native folks. See that too. Well, That's all. I volunteered yeah. in a school and yeah. did artwork with these kids, and it was incredible. It was mm -hmm. wonderful, and I saw yeah. that part. But when with your subject about like myths and realities, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, and my, my, sort of my question is, okay, uh, a lot of people would say, well, is that then a myth? No. Nope. No, it's a reality. For some. But what I'm saying is for actually a small percentage, not the majority. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say is, well, by not even addressing it, it's ignoring like the majority of native people's experience. And that's not which is what I'm suggesting is we need to see indigenous peoples better. Because you had one experience, and that has now shaped what you think about all Native peoples. And what I'm, what I'm telling you is, no, no, what I'm saying is I think that's very common. I mean, like the idea of you mentioned people go to powwows, and they get one impression, and that's the only impression they get. So if you as an individual only accept that one view, I, I, I'm not going to hear this. I can't fix it. But, you, you know, hopefully folks are interested in hearing the bigger picture. So the negative is not the only story. And most Native peoples don't live on reservations today. So the statistics on that? Yeah, there are. And they're easy to find. So, yeah, I would, I would yeah. Indigenous people live off reservations mm -hmm. as to how many live on. And I don't have them memorized, but they're super easy to find. You can go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. You can go to any Native Nations website. They've got all kinds of statistics about numbers of members that live on there. If they have a reservation, or like the Osage Nation, they don't have a reservation. They just own land. And they bought their land from the Cherokee way back in the day when the Cherokee were moved. You know that thing called Trail of Tears? Okay, do you want to talk about depressing? Um, so they moved, but they had all this territory, and the Osage were going to be moved off their land up north, and so they came down and said to the Cherokee, can we buy some of your land? Cherokee, like, sure, here. So now the Osage actually own their land. It's not a reservation. They own the land. It's theirs. So, again... Every nation has its own identity. Every nation has its own story. Every nation has moved through dealing with the American project in its own way, some to a greater success than others, we'll say. Hang on. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you were Thank talking you. about, um, I'm not sure if I get it correct, which is nation land um, versus you've purchased a property but not, might not be federally recognized. What are some of the other important cultural identifiers or that say this is we exist versus well you kind of don't you don't have the proper card you don't have the proper nation well for the federal government there is only one and it's it was the Dawes rolls when a man named Dawes decided to do a census uh, way back in the 18 something something <laughs> and uh, he went around and he like I said I'm not a hist I'm not a historian that's you um, and and he went around and he took a census of all the native peoples and some of the native peoples were like sure put us down and some of them were like hey get off my land <laughs> and they had no idea that it would now come down years later to whether they are recognized by the federal government as a nation or not like, they could never have predicted that. So for the federal government, but no, for individuals, you talk to individual Native folks, I mean, that's why I say some of them, they are absolutely very much their culture, their community, their identity, even though their nation doesn't have federal recognition. You've been waiting very long. Thank you. Yeah, we'll do Rob and Barb, <laughs> yep. and then if anybody else wants to stick around, you'll yep. stick around yeah, for I can a few hang minutes, out right? And then yeah. after these two questions, I will announce our new board. <laughs> He needs a microphone. So I'm going to take a microphone because I'm going to take a few minutes. I, I wanted to kind of support some of what you said earlier with a little bit of detail. First of all, uh, the fun T-shirts. I have a Native friend who has a shirt that says, I'm part white, but I can't prove it. <laughs> See, I love that. Yeah. But, um, Mouthy T-shirts. Yeah. I'm a big fan. <laughs> I'll, show you, I'll show you mine later. Okay. But one of the issues, when you talked about uh, recognition, the complications there include the ones you spoke about, but also in some cases there are Native nations who had agreements before the U.S. government was formed. So the pre-colonial, it's tremendously ironic that a lot of the New England nations don't have status as federal tribes because they made agreements with the Crown, which didn't That's carry right. over. And their struggles go on today. And another one, and we could spend a lot of time talking about it, but uh, in a number of cases, people who intermarried with African people rather than with European people are more likely to be denied native uh, 
identity, not only by the federal government, but even by native tribes. Absolutely. Disenrollment is a serious problem. The sad thing about yeah. that is it's a, it's a common byproduct of colonization is that the colonized people end up fighting over the scraps that are given. And, and it, right. it's, the, it's kind of an ugly underbelly in the native world, but it's also very often native people are trying to address it and in, in the gov- government actually gets in the way of True. that. Of that. Um, there's an interesting quote about identity. Sherman Alexie once said, you ain't Indian unless at least, it, unless at least one time in your life you wished you weren't. And uh, <laughs> sounds, that's, that's kind of interesting. Sounds, talk, sounds, it has a resonance of truth talk, to me. Talk, talk about cult, cultural identity. The last thing I wanted to just comment on is the, the idea of the language, uh, the culture living in the language. The, the, if you explore that further, you find that there are just ways of expressing things that we don't have in English. There are ways right. of thinking. For instance, ours is mostly an object-based language, a noun-based language. Many native mar- languages are verb-based, so there are, there are states of being and doing rather than... And if, you, if you're not naming things, you're, you're there, naming is a sort of a way of claiming. If you think of the Adam and Eve story where God tells Adam to name all the animals, and that automatically creates a hier- hierarchical way of being, whereas among native people the language is more likely to be reciprocal and participatory and is not and is likely to have much more expressions of connection and action than belong, than ownership and so the culture really does live in the languages and the fact that the languages are being restored in some native nations is just amazing and some of the It's stories, a very positive some movement. Some of the stories are miraculous yeah. like if you know the one about how the Wampanoags are getting their language back yes. it's tremendous. Anyway, could go on and on but just wanted to kind of broaden out a little bit of what you had said. Thank you. Thank you. And everything he said, yes. All right. <laughs> we will finish up with Barb. Okay. Thank you all. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, uh, I don't have any Native American blood, so I'm not going to make any kind of profession. No, here, no but, qualifiers. Um, I do have um, experience living in Oklahoma. I lived there for about 15 years, and when I first moved there as an East Coaster, Uh, First of all, I found out that a lot of people thought I was really rude. Um, But the other thing is, is that uh, probably like one in eight people would tell you their story about how their family had Native American blood and some people had cards and some people didn't have cards. Um, There's a lot of Native owned land out there. (laughs) Um, There's also a lot of casinos. Um, And... You know, I think that at this point, you know, they've kind of figured out how to turn a really bad situation into a good situation out there. Um, A lot of them have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Because Oklahoma was a place where a lot of Native Americans were pushed. You mentioned Trail of Tears. Um, So, again, uh, when I went there, they said, oh, this is the home of the five civilized tribes. I heard that a lot. Um, So you had, like, the Fox and the Sioux and the Cherokee and the uh, Osage, and I'm trying to remember all of them, but I can't remember. Chickasaw? Chickasaw, yeah. Maybe? Yeah. Maybe um, Choctaw? Choctaw, Choctaw, yeah, Choctaw yeah. Chickasaw, I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I met a lot of people. I worked with a lot of people. Um, you know, I had neighbors, friends, all kinds of people that I just knew. None of them were on reservations. Um, and they all seemed to, you know, just be going about their lives just like everybody else. Um, and again, a lot of people, <laughs> you look at them and you're like, wow, well, you you don't look Native American, but, yeah, they very much would have stories about their family and, you know, the decisions that their grandparents had made because of the times, because of prejudice um, and the way that they were treated so that they, they would just try to pass as not Native. Um, right, because, I, I'm, and I'm sure you ran into this, you know, being Native in this country, you know, it's... There, there can be a lot of stigma attached to that. I mean, we can all recite what the stereotypes are, and I'm not going to do that now, but we all know the language used to describe historically Native peoples is not positive, right? So claiming Native identity, imagine the irony that some Native folks now are like, really, you're trying to claim Native identity as a positive? Like, they, they've been dealing with it as a, quote, negative for the outside culture for so many years. It's not, you know, it's just their reality, Right. So, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. That's, yeah, that's good. So thank you very much, all of you, for listening. I'll hang out for a little bit if anybody wants to talk to me or have any questions. But I appreciate your attention kindly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and-